We're back, and this is Joan with the Joan Yurkovich Show. Here again, we're talking to our lo two local hunters, Terry and Michael Hauschel, father and son. And one of the things we were talking about before we went to break that I want to get back to is that you guys are quite a bit of, you're trappers. Is that what you call yourselves? Yeah. Yes, a fur harvester, whatever. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard it called a fur harvester. So it is about then getting pelts and selling them, is that correct? Correct. So what, what kind of... Uh, animals do you trap for their furs? Coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, beavers, muskrats. Whoa, I was expecting like two things. You came out with quite a list there. You actually have buyers for those pelts? Correct. Now you have to yourselves then um, skin those or how do you have to prep them? I'm, I don't think that they're going to do that part so how do you do that? We skin everything except for the bobcats because normally the fur buyers like to do it their own way, so we just leave the bobcats on the belt, or right? On this carcass, on the carcass. Yeah. And do you have to get them to them at a certain time, or do you have to keep them somewhat cold or frozen? Yeah. Or they have to be kept. If I went to your freezer at your house, you'd have a bobcat in it. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any in there right now. Actually, there might be some. In there. Uh, I, I think we sold everything last year. <laughs> Yeah, we had to get. Do you have to salt freezer. down the pelts? And, yeah, I'm sure. One in the garage. I mean, it's not like yeah. the one you're pulling your dinner hamburger out from or yeah, something. There's a quite know. a story goes behind that uh -huh. that we'll have to tell on another day when we have more time. <laughs> we came home. Well, it was a wild boar hunt. Uh, about three in the morning, we were exhausted, and we'd uh, before we had our own freezer, we had double wrapped a, a boar head we were going to have mounted, and we had it wrapped in plastic, and then in a trash bag, and another trash bag. And, 3 a.m. we were tired, so we just shoved it in the main freezer. It was clean, you know, it was a plastic. <laughs> According bottle. to you, maybe yeah. not your wife. <laughs> For some reason, before I got home from work the next day, my wife decides to go out and get something to defrost. Why, in God's green earth, she would unwrap that thing? I have no idea. But she did. I got a phone call at work, and let me tell you, she was less than... Uh, Far less excited about having it in her freezer yeah. than we So that weekend, we got to have our own freezer, didn't we, Michael? Well, yeah, it just gave you an excuse to run out and get your own big freezer and get the biggest one you can so you can fill it up. So yeah. so did those pelts, when you skin them out, you have to be careful with um, the legs or the faces? or what do you? How do you do that? Do you have to salt them down? Tell us about that. Well, the, the biggest thing we do is, you know, we skin everything. Um, we usually roll it. You, you, we don't stretch the furs or tan the furs. We just skin everything. They call it green. Um, roll it um, so it's it, the the fur all still lays the proper way. We comb it out, get all the cockleburrs and mud and whatever may be in it, and and then we prep them, put them in a plastic bag, and take them down and put them in the freezer until we take them to the buyer. And then when we get ready to take them to the buyer, you have to thaw them just a little bit so you can lay them out flat and we lay everything out and then he goes through and grades everything and then they pay you for that pelt based on how it scores or how it grades out. So where do you find these buyers? Do you have to go travel to, to get to a buyer? Sometimes. We used to have one that came to Cleves uh, Boat and Marina, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, but he just recently stopped going there, I think last year, and so we had to go to was that Ellsworth where we found that other buyer? Correct. Uh -huh. And we'd go out there to sell. Well, and we used to, uh, Scott used to have one out at Fur Harvester Supply out of Gypsum. We used to go out there too. But, you know, fur harvesting, kind of like hunting, is kind of going away. There's not a lot of people involved anymore. So consequently, the people involved in, in that, you know, outdoor skill, you know, whatever you want to call it, that sporting event, there's fewer and fewer. fewer why, do you, why do you think that is? People don't want to wear furs? Or where do you think these furs go when you sell them to the buyers? Well, right now, the, the largest market for our pelts is in Europe, Germany and Russia, those areas. Um, in America, there's just not a lot of fur anymore, you know. Um, the folks, the animal activists, have been very, very successful and just kind of eliminated most of that synthetic. Um, the unfortunate part is they don't understand you know, we don't harvest those animals for the fur as much as we harvest those animals to help maintain equilibrium, you know, in God's outdoors. Um, animal conservation. Yeah. You, and I think that's something that we need to talk some more about. So tell me more about your philosophy of that because, you know, the city folks don't understand, you know, that, that some of the culling of the animal population is kind of necessary to their survival. Is that correct? Oh, yes. absolutely. 
So tell me more about that. Do you do you have any other sense of what you might want to tell folks about? You know why why we hunt in this area, why we trap in this area? Oh sure, I, I like you mentioned. That's probably one of the most not understood concepts. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen a, a deer that's suffering from chronic wasting, or at least photos or videos of that. But that chronic waste disease, I can't think of anything that would be any any more awful way it's like to It's like a starvation? Die. Well, yeah, their, their brain... They're too weak to survive, pretty much. Yeah, it atrophies, they don't know enough to drink, they run into things, they... And is that caused by overpopulation? Correct. Yes. Okay, and so so that's why, you know, the game and wildlife people, you know, allow so much hunting, and is that somewhat taken into account what the population needs to be culled down to? Absolutely. As to how many licenses or whatever they send out each year? Yes. Right. And that's something that I think, like you said, people don't realize is kind of just the natural part of, of the species being propagated and all of that. So, so um, I want you to talk a little bit, too, about what this sport means to family. It's, you know, we're maybe a little unique compared to some, but... I grew up in that environment, um, spending a lot of time in the outdoors with my dad, my brother, my brother-in-laws. Um, it's just an experience It's hard to explain. There's things you do and see and times you share. I mean, that I don't know how many folks you know, watch the sun come up in, this morning, in the morning, but when you can watch that with your son or your daughter, you know, exactly. a lot of people, it doesn't have to be a son. Or in the evening, you know, when you're out on the lake fishing and you watch that sunset, I mean, it's just amazing. And, to truly get an appreciation for all the wonderful things God's provided for us and, and this allows us to, to experience that. I think that's the big part. For Michael and I, you know, the hunt is the thrill. I mean, the, the shoot or the kill, that's, you know, that's fun. Don't get me wrong, that's, that's an important part. But it's the experience, I think, that's number one. You know, because, of course, you know, the thrill of the hunt for any sportsman, you know, is, is part of it. Did you ever get buck fever or have you ever had, Michael, that moment where you saw that animal and uh, I bet you're gonna say no go ahead well, and feel free to say no when I uh, shot my first doe I definitely was like shaking pretty bad oh. I, I never like that was I guess my first like Kansas animal with my bow and uh, I just I'd gone out several times and hadn't even seen anything and then finally that doe came up and I don't know I don't even know how to explain it but it just kind of made me really nervous and I was shaking pretty bad but I still made the shot yeah, so you had a little bit of that buck fever. Yeah. That, that, is that what they call it? You yeah. Know, exactly. A little hesitation. You know, because, and I, I'm glad that I think it's kind of a, a nice note to end on. I know this seems like it's gone awfully fast for us here, except for our technical difficulty. I have to apologize. We're hearing a beep in the background we can't seem to get rid of. But uh, nice to end on. You know, you're out there together, father and son. You're enjoying God's good earth and, and the all the things that have been placed here for all of us to use. So thank you so much, Terry and Michael, for coming to talk to me. Well, thank, thank you. you for sharing. You bet. And this is Joan with the Joan Yurkovich Show at 910 KINA Salina. Again, be sure and stay tuned for our next two guests, the Big Game Hunters, Dr. Lauren Stoskoff and Ward Schrader. We'll be talking to them. Oh, I hope that's not too annoying when we go up, but... Sorry oh. for the technical no, problems. No problem. <laughs> it no. kind of disrupted my train of thought, too. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, I tell you I had Father Randall Weber come in and talk about exorcism? No, really? Yeah. I thought that was good. So, see, now, to be honest, I would never try to run the equipment by myself with somebody like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just one of those things that... He would be complete. This would have just destroyed him. Father Randy. <laughs> really? I don't know him personally that well, but of course he's an incredibly intellectual, intelligent guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, um, I did tons of research for that, and I was so nervous. I could have never had to do all the other kind of stuff here. Let me go ahead and shut this off. Well, he was, you know, the bishop's vicar for the entire time. Exactly. So. Well, that's what he calls himself, the vicar general or vicar, mm -hmm. like well, you vicar, said. I think yeah. He's